Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle, coming up on the programme this week. Conversion therapy is essentially bigotry wrapped up as quackery and kind of pseudoscience where people claim um, that they can stop people and change people's sexual orientation or gender identity. Moreover, I've heard stories of LGBT plus young people that were not able to withstand conversion therapy and sadly made decisions to take their own life. The long term traumatic effects of this kind of abuse and violence can be really significant. LGBTQ youth who'd undergone conversion therapies were more than twice as likely to report having attempted suicide multiple times following the experience. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. Hey everyone, hope you're well. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. Hope you're enjoying your December so far. It's been a really difficult time. I know people get chocker this time of year. Always important to make sure that When you're doing your planning, you're making a bit of planning time for yourself. I think that's one of the crucial things at this time of the year, that we think that we've we've almost got to be busy. You know, we book in all these occasions, these dates, these gatherings, and actually (laughs) they can be far uh, from relaxing. Or how do you say the uh, the consequences of some of these gatherings can, of course, um, take, take their toll physically. And with that mentally as well. So do look after yourself over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, we've got new lockdown restrictions, of course, kicking in. They're not necessarily lockdown restrictions, but sort of a a plan B being introduced as well, which impacts on people's lives in a different way. And if anything, just reminds them of what we've come through in the last few years and the sorts of things we've kind of left behind to a certain extent. We're going to do the show a little bit differently this week, actually, uh, because uh, my time this week has been taken up by a, a subject which necessarily stand out as a mental health story but once you get into it and i've been investigating it this week absolutely mental health is right at the front and center of every single aspect if you like of what we're going to talk about in the program this week i've been working alongside colleagues at hits radio pride uh one of our sister stations and myself and a number of the team there put together an investigation into conversion therapy. Conversion therapy, this idea that you can offer a service which says, yeah, absolutely, we can cure you of your sexual orientation. Uh, We can cure you of being gay. We can change your sexual orientation. We can change your gender identity. And you might be thinking, what, does that still happen in 2021? And unfortunately, as we're going to hear, absolutely it is happening, but there are also significant historic contexts around this as well. Uh, so we'll talk about that too. I wasn't surprised necessarily to hear the psychological damage that conversion therapy can do, but actually I was surprised to see those stats essentially laid out, and I'll guide you through some of those stats as we move through the program this week, which really set out a difficult picture that's affecting people today. There are young people today who are going through conversion therapy, who are being told to go through conversion therapy, and What's been done about it? Well, there is something that's been done about it. A government consultation looking into a ban on conversion therapy. So we're going to spend a little bit of time hearing a range of voices, which uh, the Hits Radio Pride team, including myself, have gathered over the course of the week that set out the whole story. They give you a sense of maybe some of the debates that still exist around conversion therapy. And there are, you know, more than one side to this particular story, let me assure you, as we'll be uh, setting out. First and foremost, though, for those who are uncertain about whether or not there's a, a link between conversion therapy and mental health, let's just spend a little bit of time with a friend of the show, actually, Dominic Arnell, uh, CEO of Just Like Us, who help and support young LGBTQ plus people. Um, and he's actually setting out for us here just how serious the issue is when it comes to conversion therapy and the mental health of those who are undergoing it. I think sadly everyone that works with LGBT plus young people will have met young people that have been through conversion therapy. It's horrific and moreover I've heard stories of LGBT plus young people that were not able to withstand conversion therapy and sadly made decisions to take their own life. So I think the seriousness of what we're talking about really can't be underplayed. If you tell someone that who they are is deeply, deeply shameful that is an incredibly damaging and an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Dominic Arnold there from Just Like Us, brilliant organisation and a friend of the show. Great to hear from him once again. Now, in terms of like this being a live issue, evidence from 2017, just a few years ago, suggests that around one in every 20 members of the LGBTQ plus community has been offered conversion therapy. Um, and actually 2% have undergone 
therapy. And the, the figures for the trans community are significantly higher, in fact, with around 13% of respondents to a major survey saying they'd been offered therapy. Let's hear from uh, Louis Asquith from Mermaids, who support young trans people and their families. He says the evidence that they've heard backs up claims that therapy can lead to those serious negative outcomes for young people. There is a, a 2018 study which found that LGBTQ youth who'd undergone conversion therapies were more than twice as likely to report having attempted suicide multiple times following the experience. So that's just a, a snapshot into how serious and impacting this horrendous practice is. I'll put a link to all these different organisations in the write-up to this week's Mental Health Monday. Um, it's obviously a live issue now in 2021 and a ban uh, will be uh, forthcoming, it would appear, next year in 2022. But actually, historically, conversion therapy has been something which has been going on for decades and decades and decades. People who are offering services, making claims to cure someone of being gay or to, you know, persuade them that, you know, however they feel in, an, in a natural way from their gender identity um, is wrong and it needs to be changed uh, for various different means. You're going to hear two voices now from two gentlemen who experienced uh, in the 1960s and in the 1970s what was known as aversion therapy, um, trying to tell someone or cure someone of being gay through means which you will, I'm sure, find absolutely horrific and horrendous. Jeremy and Pete share their story and it's incredibly upsetting to hear what they had to go through. Uh, the fear that they experienced, but also the coercion that they experienced. In, in some ways, not absolutely explicit, but very much enforced if you like you know they weren't dragged to these institutions where these events took place but it was made very very clear to them through social norms expectations or threats about the future that this was something which was very much uh, going to happen whether or not they fully agree to it or not, as we will hear. Uh, Pete's voice might seem familiar to uh, some of you as well. Pete Price, who was one of my colleagues at, at Radio City, taught for many, many years as well. Uh, incredibly brave to share this story. It's a side of Pete which he often doesn't talk about, but what a huge impact this must have had on his life. Jeremy as well, speaking about this issue and his experience from the 1970s. Now, I will say at this point, you may find this element of the program quite upsetting. Uh, it does contain uh, sometimes quite uh, explicit explanations about what was going on. Uh, an opportunity to skip forward if you if you need to in terms of the podcast as well. But important to see that this is a very much a human story with real humans involved in it. I was in the last year before I took my A level. I'd fallen in love with a lad called Stephen. We had a couple of reasonable couple of years doing what young gay kids did. The word gay didn't exist, it was homosexual. You couldn't be one of those uh, because society said, you know, and I'm a 12 year old boy and I'm getting feelings for my mates. When it came to the Easter before my exams, Stephen said we'll be uh, finishing seeing each other again. And I wasn't ready for it. I ran out of class because I couldn't handle the pressure in my head. A priest went past. I mean, this still affects me now, 50 years on. And he said I was asked if I was OK, and I said no. The headmaster said to me, we're going to expel you. <sighs> and then he said, unless um, you have another option, we can cure you. society were against us. Remember, I was a criminal and you went to prison uh, for 10, 20 years. You could go to prison for just being who you were. So if I get upset every now and then, you'll understand why. My mother had found a letter and she was waving this piece of paper at me and my life flashed. It was one of those stupid things you'd kept, you know. Dear Peter, if you marry Tony, I'll kill myself. Love, John. It was a stupid, childish thing. And it's, she said, what does it mean? And I said, I'm a homosexual. And she promptly uh, was physically sick, told me to get out of the house, and in fact cried herself to sleep for three years every night of her life. So I thought my only way of escaping the situation I was in was to get 
pass my A-levels and get to university. I'd been accepted at a couple of universities. Basically, it meant I had to go for the cure. So in some ways, you could say I volunteered. But I don't think I did. I went to see a psychiatrist and they said, oh, yeah, we can cure you. So they put me in um, the mental institute and there's prison bars on the windows. And, and I was in under a false name, very, very scared. In my heart of hearts, I knew there wasn't a cure, but I did it for my mother and also did it because I thought society might accept me more. I went to see this um, psychiatrist who was um, horrible and he told me I had this disease and they could cure me and <sighs> the therapy started on the 6th of June. Hang on, let me get myself back together. It's 50 years on, I'm still like this. And this psychiatrist recorded everything you do sexually but using the graphic graphic language then they put me in a room about the size of the studio but with no windows uh with a male nurse and i was in the bed I wasn't allowed to wear pajamas and had these magazines which were men in bathing costumes what there was nothing dirty about them they were just men in bathing costumes and i had to listen to the hour tape halfway through the hour they injected me and i said I i'm going to be really sick and i need to go to the toilet they said that's fine just go so I went to the toilet in the bed and was sick in the bed. And that lasted an hour and an hour and an hour and an hour. And for 72 hours, they tortured me. They fixed my arm to the size of the chair. On my right arm, they fixed the strap, which had a couple of terminals on that uh, were going to give me electric shocks in the arm. There were two screens in this room. On the screens will appear pictures of naked men. When I looked at these, I'd get an electric shock. That was Tuesday morning. I had a session every couple of days for the next couple of weeks. I sent for the psychiatrist because I was in such a bad state. And the reason I was in a bad state was I thought nobody's going to find me because I was illegal. So I was under a false name. My mother even wouldn't know if they'd have come to the door and said, I'm, your son's not here. That's all I was worried about. I sent for the doctor, uh, the psychiatrist, and he came and I didn't think they were going to let me out. I was in a terrible state. Uh, and he said, well, all right, then we'll bring the treatment forward. So we'll now put the electrodes on your penis. Uh, so you get electric shocks if you get an erection. I said, I'm lying in my own excrement. The stench is vile. I've got nothing left to cough up. I can't go to the toilet again. And you expect me to get, but then I pulled back because I thought, I'm not going to get out of here. Towards the end of the aversion therapy, they changed tactics. Instead of showing me pictures, they took the pictures away, screens away, and I had to lie down naked on a bed, and they, the electric was still attached to me. They told me to imagine being with Stephen, and now they were working on pictures, they were working on my brain and my mind. Then they gave me electric shocks. I want to carry on thinking about Stephen, but I want the pain to stop. And what my brain did uh, in 1972, I imagined. <sighs> I imagined I saw Stephen die in a road accident. And by doing that, I could honestly tell these doctors that I didn't love Stephen anymore, because to me he was dead. <sighs> and the version of the stopped. I rang a pal of mine up. He didn't know why he was picking me up. Nobody knew, and uh, I went home, and my mother was away, and I must have bathed and washed and scrubbed myself for eight hours, nine hours. And when she came home, she never forgave me for walking out and not finishing the treatment. For the next 40 years, I believe that I saw Stephen die. And I didn't find out that I didn't until 2011. Two months later, I was in a gay club in Manchester called Rockingham. There at the bar was the psychiatrist, so the man that put me through the torture was gay. From that day onwards, I said, I'm going to be who I am. If any MP listens to this and they want to think about banning this damn stuff, please get it banned, just for me. That's Jeremy sharing his story alongside uh, my uh, former colleague, Pete Price, um, what about that? You know, what an experience that those two 
men went through as young men and experience from people who were saying to them, we can cure you of being gay. And, you know, the, the long-term impacts of that, you know, must have been huge on their lives. Really, really upsetting and incredible honesty and bravery for them to speak out as well. So we thank them for their time. And I mentioned there, you know, if MPs are listening to this, we'll hear from an MP actually uh, very shortly. who's actually going to take this through uh, conversion therapy, the, the ban itself through Parliament. Now, there is a consultation which was launched asking people what they thought of the plans to ban conversion therapy, asking to hear evidence from those who will be impacted by a ban. Now, this ban would include ensuring physical conversion therapy access sentenced appropriately and introducing a new offence of so-called talking conversion therapies. It would ensure those found guilty of conversion therapy offences have any profit they obtained from those crimes removed, and also introducing conversion therapy protection orders to protect potential victims from undergoing the practice, uh, including being moved abroad to undergo that practice. And of course, central to all of this as well is providing support to those who've experienced or have been told they have to experience conversion therapy and that's clearly an ongoing issue too. Lenny Morris is from Gallup which set up a national conversion therapy helpline once it was clear that this was a huge issue. They say that the experience of those who've been coerced into these conversion therapy practices are clearly very very damaging. We also see people who are going through really horrific forms of abuse and violence you know from the scope of really severe psychological abuse as you see with being prayed over or being told repeatedly that you're sick and having visits from people who tell you you're sick all the way through to sexual violence that is supposed to correct someone's orientation and and right up through physical abuse up to threatened homicide. The long-term traumatic effects of this kind of abuse and violence can be really significant. And I'll give you a link to the uh, National Conversion Therapy Helpline, which Gallup have set up at the end of the podcast, so stay tuned to that. Now, there are two sides to this story, to a certain extent, or two arguments to a certain extent, because um, there are some who believe, and it's contained as well within the government consultation in terms of the wording, that some people might choose to explore conversion therapy. They may choose to do it for potentially personal beliefs, religious beliefs, and so on and so forth. So should it be banned that they are not allowed to pursue those particular um, desires if they feel like they want to achieve it? Now, it would have to be very, very robust, and the government sets out that it would have to be absolutely clear that that person was choosing themselves to undertake or seek support or therapy uh, because they were unhappy themselves with their own sexual orientation or gender identity. And that's something that the uh, Evangelical Alliance are very wary of. Uh, as part of the investigation for Hits Radio Pride, we heard from Peter Linus from the Evangelical Alliance, who says that people still should have a choice as long as it is a choice. But people choose or consent to go and speak to someone, then we think they should have the freedom to go and do that. If that involves prayer, if that involves pastoral support on the journey, and that's something that the, the person has freely chosen, then we believe the law shouldn't be involved in restricting that. That's part of our human rights. That's part of freedom of religion. It's part of freedom of belief and, and personal choice. So it's interesting, that, isn't it? This idea of, you know, the human rights and the human right to religion. If you maybe place your own sexuality or gender identity below where you perceive religion in your life. But I would say this, earlier in the program, we heard from two guys who supposedly chose conversion therapy, who walked through the door. But in many ways, they would have been said, are you here by choice? They would have said yes. In reality, as we heard from the evidence provided by Jeremy and by Pete, it wasn't a choice, was it? It was coercion. It was societal expectation. And I think that's one of those things where you've got to be so specific, you know, around those opportunities. That if someone is making a choice, how much of a choice is it really? If it's coming from a place where a religious belief is telling you what you're feeling about yourself is wrong. I think that's going to be a really careful thing to watch in regard to this. But like I say, I wanted to represent the fact there were other angles to this story and there were other people who were trying to say, well, maybe sure, some people should be allowed to, to undergo conversion therapy. You can make up your own mind as to whether or not that's something that you would support. We mentioned the uh, MPs who are supporting it, and there have been many cross-party MPs who have been speaking about this one. Let's hear, though, from uh, the MP Alicia Cairns, who's leading calls through Parliament 
She says that it's absolutely clear that a ban is needed and that she intends to push it through until the law's changed. I have met with so many survivors um, since I got elected and the anger and injustice that it makes you feel, but also the helplessness. And that is, that is one of the reasons I became an MP, to be a voice for those who others seek to silence, to be a voice for those who, so that I can do something and be helpful and not feel helpless. Um, you know, there are women who've been forced into marriages, men who've been forced into marriages, people who've been raped, people who've been made to sit on the floor while they are told that there are demons within them that need to be spat out of their system and hit repeatedly, locked in a room and starved. These are truly appalling acts. That's Alicia Cairns there. Now, it's important to say, actually, that the government consultation, which has just closed on this matter, actually sets out that there is no robust evidence that conversion therapy works. I think it's important to say that, isn't it? That this idea that it's been allowed or that it should be allowed for personal beliefs or religious beliefs, it doesn't work. There's no evidence, robust evidence that can be tested that says that it could work. And I think that's one of those things which have got to be front and centre. Although when it comes to beliefs, imagine again, and we talk about the mental health and we talked about the threat and the risk to suicide of these people undergoing it. Imagine being told that, well, if it didn't work, it's because you didn't want it to work. Or if you didn't work, it's because you didn't care enough or you didn't pray hard enough. Or it's because you wanted to betray your family or your family's beliefs. How difficult is that to deal with? Particularly when it comes from you know, a close-knit community. It might be a religious group. It might be friends. It might be family. Society's expectation on you to not be the person who you actually are. And that might be someone who's got a trans identity that you weren't expecting to have when you were born. But guess what? It's just a normal part of life. You may not have realised growing up that you might one day be attracted to someone of the same sex. But guess what? That's happened to you. And we know, don't we? As an informed society, it happens and it happens absolutely everywhere. It's also happened for literally millennia. We've just placed a stigma around it that says that it's wrong or that some people believe it's wrong. And of course, the conversion therapy helpline uh, is there for people who have maybe been coerced into conversion therapy or who have been told that they have to undergo it. Maybe they've undergone it last year five years ago, 10 years ago, however long ago, and they want to get some support, there is a conversion therapy helpline that's up and running. It's up and running uh, between um, 10 and 4, Monday to Friday. That's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's provided by Gallup, the uh, organization, G-A-L-O-P. Now, the number is 0800 130 35. That's 0800 130 35. Again, lines are open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, I told you the show was going to be a little bit different today, but I felt like it was a really important thing to sort of bring to people's attention. I think a lot of people would just say, what? Is this still happening? And they say conversion therapy, this idea you call it therapy, that's what it's known as. So that's why I'm using that particular language as well. It doesn't work. And of course, uh, the ban will go through because I think there is such huge support for it. There is nuance into how, how that ban will go through. And of course, the enforcement in the future is crucial too. But again, putting mental health front and center in terms of people's situations, if you've undergone it, if you feel coerced into undergoing those pressures, those societal pressures, I don't think will go away. Even if the law changes, if people are still saying to you how you're feeling about yourself is wrong and you need to do something about it, I think we're in a position for a long, long time that those people will need support, they'll need help, and of course, there may be long-term consequences to having those feelings in the long term. Uh, we wish, of course, anyone who's been involved in that all the very best. It must have been incredibly difficult to go through as well. That helpline is there if you want to speak to someone. Of course, there are some fantastic charities. We heard, of course, from uh, Mermaids. We heard from Gallup. And we heard from Just Like Us through the podcast today. The Conversion Therapy Helpline is up and running too. And we thank, of course, Jeremy and Pete for sharing their stories. I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 852 
0208 that's if you're experiencing a personal crisis uh, you're unable to cope and need support uh, shout to 85258 that's a text line do get involved in those services in an absolute emergency always remember the number to call is 999 thanks for downloading the podcast this week we'll be back next week with more mental health monday